Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Next up, we are going to talk about exercise and limb girdle. Um, thank you all for everyone uh, chatting in all of their thoughts and questions and opinions. We had quite a few people chat in about exercise and what you should do, what you shouldn't do. So I hope you guys are still connected and going to watch this session. This is very important to a lot of those questions. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce our next presenters, Mary Kingston and Erin Young. Mary Kingston graduated from Gannon University with a doctorate in physical therapy in 2010 and is a board certified neurologic clinical specialist through the APA. And she works full time with the neurological population. And Erin Young has been an occupational therapist for the last 15 years. And she is also a certified hand therapist. They both work for UPMC Centers for Rehab Service. So ladies, I will turn it over to you. If you could turn on your video and un Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hi. Thank you for joining us. We're so excited. We, we love talking about exercise in this, in this uh, population because we don't feel like people get referred to therapy enough. So it's really neat to be able to have a forum to, uh, to encourage it. So, Well, we will probably have lots of questions, so I'll let you get to it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Erin Young, and I'm an occupational therapist. Uh, we have worked with the neuro population for several years and enjoy what we do. And some of the objectives of our talk, we're going to go over why it's important to have therapy and how it can help. So really big thing are falls. We want to make sure that people aren't falling and that they can build their, and, and realize that they can build their muscular strength to avoid falls and to become more coordinated. Uh, once we stop doing and stop exercising and stop that process, any type of neurological <laughs> problem is just going to take over and wreak havoc. So the big thing is slowing things down. Uh, so we're going to talk about risk factors that could uh, be that could cause increased falls. We're going to learn about how to gain strength and improve your posture. We're also going to talk about adaptive equipment because there is stuff out there that can help you lead safer lives. So dressing equipment, and we're going to talk about how to obtain the equipment. And also, we want you guys to understand the difference between occupational therapy and physical therapy and how each therapy can benefit you. Uh, so we're going to go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so I'm sure you guys have heard all about this all day uh, in this presentation, but for therapists, it's so important to take each person individually. So even though you have one specific type of muscular dystrophy, we're not going to kind of put you in a box and say, well, this is X, Y, and Z. This is what you need to do. People are so dynamic and everybody is very individualistic as far as what they need. And we look at each person in that way so that we can help them live their best life. So things vary. Uh, even even patterns of muscular dystrophy and and how they present. So we're very sensitive as therapists to hit all of your needs and make sure that we're helping you the best that we can. So I'm going to open up um, the next slide, please. And I'm going to let Mary Kingston, who's our physical therapist, talk about how physical therapy can help you. So Physical therapy can be, you know, um, an ankle sprain or a knee replacement, things like that. But what I do is all neurological based stuff. So that's working on, you know, balance and falls and function. Um, so we're really looking into things that can um, happen within these neuro neuromuscular diseases that can cause loss of this function. So um, the consequences with muscular dystrophy of this progressive muscle loss can be a loss of ability to perform transfer. Something as simple as getting out of a chair, getting out of bed, um, getting in and out of the tub, shower, the bathroom transfers are especially dangerous because of the slippery and hard surfaces that you can fall on. 
Um, also, we look at your gait or how you walk. Um, oftentimes, you know, you decrease your speed, so it's no longer, you can't cross the street anymore. You know, things that you take for granted all your life and then suddenly um, these things fall apart. Um, foot drop is a big thing that can happen as well, so we work with bracing and things like that. Um, also, um, stepping over things, stepping on the things, accessing houses um, with steps and curbs and those kinds of uh, situations. And also just decreased endurance and activity tolerance. So those are things that can happen within the body. Um, and then there's also some extrinsic or external risk, risk factors that we have to look at. Um, you know, in Erie, I know we're from all over here, but in Erie, we have a lot of ice and snow. So that's a big consideration for us here. Uh, uneven surfaces, um, it's just like, you know, uneven sidewalks and things that you can trip on. Um, these are all things that, you know, somewhat we can control. Um, you know, not going out into the ice and snow, not wearing uh, the next one's improper footwear, you know, sandals and flip flops, I always laugh, are like high heels, you know, people who come in with these um, kinds of shoes that can cause tripping and falling and they're coming to me for balance. So it's always something you have to think about, but we have to point these things out to people, um, especially um, with poor lighting situations, um, dimly lit environments. Uh, sometimes when you lose your peripheral, um, you know, your, the, your feet and your balance on um, your peripheral sensors, um, at times, you know, you rely more on your vision for balance. And so in the dusk and the darkness, um, we ask you to, you know, put more night lights out and things like that, just so that you can set yourself up for success. Um, just inadequate use of assistive devices. But then at the bottom there, you can see that sometimes assistive devices can be a risk because it's hard to, you know, once you lose your coordination, can you coordinate a cane? Um, so there's a lot of things that you have to consider with your environment as well as your own body that we can talk about. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. Another huge risk for falls is confidence. When you lose your confidence, you can see um, in that last slide, there was a big busy environment and that can really um, be overwhelming. You know, I think that's a mall or something. <laughs> you know, it can be very overwhelming. Is somebody gonna bump into me, you know? Um, Am I going to be able to negotiate around all these obstacles? All those kinds of things. Does that environment make you dizzy? Um, so a fear of falling is really, really a huge thing that we address in therapy with most neuromuscular diseases, not just muscular dystrophy. It's actually found to be the number one fear in the elderly. Um, so it's associated with um, all of those restrictions that you see listed there. and especially I am concerned about so social isolation and depression because those are things that can really bring you into yourself and keep you from being active. Next slide, please. So I always like to talk about this fall cycle that people don't realize happens, but it happens more than you realize. So, um, you don't, you can start anywhere on the cycle. Um, usually it starts in that blue circle with the fear of falling. So a fear of falling in turn causes a restriction of activity because you're afraid to challenge yourself. You know, you might not go out to a friend's house because they have stairs coming into the house and you know, you're afraid you're going to be embarrassed and fall. Um, so then that restriction of activity will bring weakness and poor endurance in that orange circle because you're not moving as much. And any of us, whether we have a neurological disease or not, if we stop moving, we're going to get weaker, despite age or anything. So then that can cause decreased balance reactions, which then in turn can actually cause a fall. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So then we continue around the circle because as you fall, then that automatically triggers a increased fear of falling, and then you continue, <laughs> which causes more restriction of activity, more weakness. So what I like to do, what I like to tell people, we're going to turn that back around. We're going to spiral you upward instead of downward and build your confidence. Next slide, please. So a lot of you were, I, I saw I was kind of following the feed there and I was excited to see the questions about exercise and what should I do, what shouldn't I do? I have trouble with this. Uh, you know, why is exercise so important though? You, you can't avoid it. 
because I run into this all day long because I work with this neurological population 100% of the time. And, you know, people are afraid to exercise because they're afraid, you know, they've had a bad experience, they've overdone it. But truly, exercise is medicine these days. Uh, we really, really like to um, do what we can without taking pills as much as possible because then you have all those side effects. And while medicine is also an important part of the equation, exercise is something that's already healthy for the body. Um, so the big, big question is, do exercise recommendations change when a person is dealing with a neurological diagnosis? Next slide, please. So I just found, I mean, you know, there's a gajillion recommend, recommendations out there for the general population. You know, they say, okay, you should do cardio three times a week and strength training three times a week. And, you know, just all these things that you hear, um, you know, when you go to a gym and from personal trainers and things like that. And that's a wonderful advice. And things like you see on this slide can be great recommendations for the general population, but it really, is a cautionary thing for somebody with a neurological disease like muscular dystrophy. So we kind of set those things aside and look at you as an individual. Next slide, please. So what happens is, is a whole bunch of therapists get together with a whole bunch of different research projects and we have some, something called a systematic review and we look at it, the big picture of all the studies. And that brings us together with some general recommendations um, for people with specifically limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which is really exciting because we always want to be helpful and not harmful, you know? Um, so studies have shown that you should be seeing physical therapy and occupational therapy, which sometimes I think people are a little bit afraid to seek us out because it might hurt or, you know, we might work you too hard or something like that. But in reality, we really try to meet you wherever you're at, whether you're super high level, you barely have any symptoms or you're in a wheelchair, you know, we, we tailor it to you. So they're also showing that must due to the muscle degeneration, the exercise approach with this population needs to be different than the general population. Um, because this high intensity exercise can cause myoglobinuria or this exercise induced muscle damage. So we always have to keep that in mind, that happy medium between over exercising and not doing enough. And we can be your teammate to help you figure that out. Um, so just so you know, I wanted to put on these warning signs here. You're feeling weaker rather than stronger within 30 minutes of exercise, excessive muscle soreness 24 to 48 hours following. And, and that doesn't include the general muscle soreness that we all get that's a normal response that means like you cannot get out of bed kind of thing um, severe muscle cramping heaviness or prolonged shortness of breath we don't want to see any of that stuff if that stuff happens we need to back off um, and also low impact aerobic exercise combined with submaximal strength training is what you got to do that is recommended for overall health next slide thank you so that being said, um, again, I saw some of the questions on the feed talking about stationary bike and that kind of thing. And that's kind of along the right lines. You want gentle, low impact aerobic exercise. Um, and it has been proven through studies that it has those benefits listed there. So examples being swimming, stationary bike, treadmill is really wonderful for working on your gait. It may not be possible for everybody, but like I said, we, we go um, on an individual basis with these things. And then as far as strength training goes, you want it to be submaximal. You don't want it to be super intense because that could cause some of those symptoms um, that will help start to break down your muscles faster. Um, you really, really need to focus on adequate hydration as you're exercising because that helps reduce some of the toxins and, um, and some of those um, delayed muscle soreness kinds of things. You do not exercise to exhaustion, nothing high intensity, and you need to seek out something that is very individualized to you. You can't just look online and see what somebody's doing and go with that. You know, you have to, you have to be individually treated. 
So one of the things that I drive home with therapy, because it's interesting because a lot of people with, um, when they come to me for balance training or functional training, uh, they see all the gym equipment um, that, you know, people are sitting down and just doing like, you know, just single muscle group kind of exercises. And they say, well, when am I going to get on that quad machine or something like that? And I said, well, probably not because we're going to work on functional stuff. Um, simple things like sit to stand without using your hands. If you still have the ability to do that, that is a wonderful thing to work all of those functional muscles. Sidestepping, walking backwards. I saw that on one of the messages that walking backwards was suggested and that's very accurate. Um, marching in place, step up, step taps, where you, you don't step all the way up onto a step, but you're just standing on the floor and then tapping to the first step. Step overs, soccer kicks, fun stuff. But you'll notice a trend with these things um, but the trend is, is that um, being able to have good balance on one foot is actually really, really important to just about any functional activity that you do, whether it's walking, because you have to balance on one foot while the other foot is swinging through nice and, uh, nice and, <laughs> nice and easy. I'm losing my words already. <laughs> it's a Saturday, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you have to be able to balance on one foot while you're stepping over something, balance on one, one foot while you're stepping onto something. There's just so much foundational balance in that single leg stance uh, that it's just really, really important to drill. Also working on compliant surfaces. We do a lot of stuff on foam. Um, you just have different wobble boards and things like that because we want to work those ankle reactions as long as we still have them. Um, so, you know, there's lots of things that we would do as an individual. Again, I want to drive that home. You are an individual. And so we look at you as an individual. You know, you won't get from us, you know, you all should do this one exercise. No, that's just not possible. So why we go to physical therapy? Here's a little plug for physical therapy. Um, we provide services who have impairments and functional limitations. It does not, like I said, have to be somebody who is in pain or suffering from an injury. It is very, very relevant for the neurological population as well. Otherwise, we'd be out of a job. And it's, it's, it's essential, really, um, for best results in delaying the disease and helping you have a good quality of life. Because that's what we're looking for, is quality of life. There are certain things we can't control, but we want you to have the best life you can. No fear and all of those good things. We could go to the next slide. Thank you. So the difference between a personal trainer and a physical therapist in this situation, um, I, I very much respect personal trainers. I'm actually dating one, so <laughs> I have to have respect for them. Uh, but there is a, a big difference in the general population, like we said, versus somebody with a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And the personal trainers are excellent with the general population. They have a lot of knowledge for that but we have a lot more training and education specifically in this neurological population. So it's a very different approach. Um, and I would encourage people to start with physical and occupational therapy, and then maybe you can transition to a gym with a personal trainer once you kind of have an idea of the kinds of things that you should do. It's not that you can never see them. I just think that it's good to have a little bit of guidance in the beginning with somebody who really, really hones in on the fact that you have limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Um, and the other point here is um, I sat for my NCS, which is a neurological clinical specialist. And I can personally tell you it is a rigorous process. It was kind of a career long goal. Um, but it is somebody who has done extra training, um, done extra research, and uh, sat for a board exam. Um, so they really are specializing in neurology. There's so many PTs out there who, you know, they, they see, you know, some neuro stuff every once in a while, but they're primarily orthopedic. But we want you to really, really go to somebody who is specializing in it. And one of the things I tell people is, you know, call up a clinic if you don't know if somebody has an NCS or you don't know if they do neuro in a clinic near you, ask them, say, you know, how many people with muscular dystrophy do you see in a year? Or how much neurology do you do in a year? They say, well, I, I had one this year. Okay, maybe you should move on, you know? Um, so just, you know, seek out somebody who really has the knowledge to help you. Um, because we need to address all those things at the bottom of the slide, not just pain, okay? We want a comprehensive approach. And a clinic that has, 
a buddy like I have with PT or with OT and even speech, if that is relevant for you, um, these clinics can help you have really comprehensive care. Okay, go to the next slide. So my uh, final little plug here, um, this is something that I think everybody should do. And it's kind of a fun thing. So you might want to jot these down or take notes. I'm not sure if they're going to um, have these available to you at all. But there are three functional tests that are really, really simple that we do to determine if someone is a fall risk. So one's called the five times hit stand, one's the timed up and go, and the third one is walking speed. So I'll just explain those briefly in the coming slides for you so you can try it. So the five times hit to stand, again, super easy, and you may know whether you can do this or not without even trying. With your arms crossed, you're sitting in a regular high chair, you stand up from the chair completely and then sit down, and you do that five times. And if you can do it in 12 seconds or less, you're normal. If it takes you more than 15 seconds, you're actually a high fall risk. If you can't stand up without using your hands to support you at all, then that means you have a score of zero and you are a high fall risk. So you just have to keep that in mind. Next slide, please. The next simple little functional test is the timed up and go. Um, you stand up from the chair, you walk, you can measure out 10 feet. So you walk 10 feet, you pivot to turn 180 degrees to walk back to the chair and you sit down. You can use your hands to stand up from the chair with this one. Um, and you just time yourself and see how long it takes you to complete that task. You can do, uh, if you can do it in 10 to 12 seconds or less, you're normal. 14 seconds or greater, you're a fall risk. So it's very similar in the time dimensions as the five times sit to stand. And then we have walking speed. So you measure out 20 meters, or I do, um, I know some people are, are not on the <laughs> metric system, but it's a 20 meter walk. Um, and then I think that these scores are kind of interesting. Um, if you can do it in five seconds or less, you're pretty much good for walking across the street because that translates into that 1.22 meters per second on there. Um, six seconds or less is not a fall risk. So that would go like 1.0 meters per second. I'm not a metric person, so I have to think of these in <laughs> simpler terms. Um, 1.4 meters per second, which would be like four seconds that you can walk the 20 meters, that's superior. So, and anything less than that, you know, you definitely, anything less than the 1.0 or that six seconds, you might want to consider yourself a fall risk. Okay, so you really have to understand that walking slow and inefficiently really will hold you back in the community. Next slide, please. So now you've heard a lot from the physical therapy perspective and I'll look forward to your questions, but we also wanted to talk about the occupational therapy perspective because I think people don't, I mean, people don't know what I do with neuro PT, but people really don't understand a lot <laughs> what occupational therapy does. So I'm excited to give it over to Erin now. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what does, what am I interested in? What, what can be affected when your upper extremity is weak? Well, we use our hands and our arms daily for most everything that we do. So some things that might be a problem when you experience upper extremity dressing is that you might have difficulty um, or upper extremity weakness. You might have difficulty dressing. Uh, you might have trouble getting your pants, or your socks on and off. You're probably going to have trouble with buttons, zippers, anything small is going to be a problem. A lot of times when I see people with muscular dystrophy, their shoulders have been severely affected and their posture is poor. They have that bent forward posture, which is bad for anybody and can cause a lot of pain and discomfort. Uh, you're also going to see decreased hand strength. You're gonna have trouble bathing. You're gonna have trouble with hygiene type activities. You're going to have issues with working, shopping, cleaning, driving, everything that you do during the day is going to be a problem if your arms are weak. Next slide, please. So what I tell people, a quick and dirty way to des describe occupational therapy, because a lot of times people think I'm gonna get them a job. 
which is it's not, true. it's not true. <laughs> You're on your own with that. So the kinds of things that I tell people is that occupational therapists, from the moment you open your eyes in the morning to when you close them at night, what is it that you're doing? So you open your eyes in the morning, you're getting out of bed, you're going into the bathroom, you're using the bathroom, you're going to take a shower, you're going downstairs to get yourself something to eat. You know, can you do those things? Those are the kinds of tasks that I look at to see if you can do them and if, if you do them safely. So I help, re help people regain their independence and redevelop skills. You know, just exactly what the slide says for their daily living after any kind of illness or injury. And I develop a customized plan to address those, those goals that you might have, whether they be job related, whether they be self care related, or whether they be something for fun. You know, we just try to get you back to what it is that you were doing before. You may not be doing them as well as you were doing them before, but trying to get people back into life and have a good quality of life. So the types of things that I would be working on with you is of course exercise. And I do look at people's anxiety levels. We, we take a look at stress management. We, we look at your, your home. Uh, outpatient therapists generally don't go into the home, but we can recommend home health therapists to come into your home and look at the safety of your home and look at equipment that you might need and that type of thing. We also look at how to make things easier for you. So you might not be doing everything that you were doing before as well, but we look at how can we compensate for the weakness? How can we still have you involved in your life, you know, using different equipment or different styles or techniques so that you can have a good quality of life? So next slide, please. So so th this is just telling you the kinds of stuff that I look at every day, like the types of people that come in. So any kind of acute injury, like if you fell down some stairs and you broke your wrist, God forbid, or if you had a stroke, you know, any kind of hand or upper, you know, extremity injuries. I, I do splinting. I work with people with chronic pain. Uh, OTs also work with people with low vision. Uh, Work-related injuries or ergonomic evaluations, you know, for, for offices, uh, functional capacity evaluations, wheelchair evaluations, you know, OT really has, an, we're really open wide and, and we can create our own jobs and our, our own areas, which is really, really a great thing for OT. NPT does the same thing is we can really get into every niche and, and you know, leave our mark or <laughs> help people is the main thing is getting people back to what they were doing before. So I just wanted to let you guys know that there is stuff out there. A lot of times people come into me and they're like, Oh, I didn't even know that stuff existed, you know, cause they didn't use it before and they had no reason to. So a big thing that I tell people is, you know, if you're having trouble getting your shoes and socks on or your pants, you know, that can be very dangerous if you're trying to stand and get your shoes and socks on even sitting in a chair, if you have decreased balance, or if you know you go to lean forward and you feel like you're gonna fall forward because your trunk muscles are weak, this is a really great piece of equipment that's gonna help you get your, your socks and shoes off as well as get your pants on. So this piece of equipment is called a dressing stick and you can see how it looks like a shoe. If you hold it by the hook, if you bring it upright, you'll see that there's a part that goes up and there's a part that goes down. So the part that goes up, which is the tip of the shoe, helps people get their pants on. And the, t the part that goes down helps you get your shoes and socks off, even your pants down. So the big thing is, is you need a, to seek a therapy evaluation so somebody can teach you how to use this stuff. So there's another piece of equipment on the next slide that is very helpful. It's a sock aid. So there's a website up there that you can look at and that you can see how to get your socks on using this sock aid. So I tell people, don't, don't put your, your good socks on the sock aid since it's going to stretch them out. You want a pair of socks you don't really care about, you know, your, your Hanes or your Fruit of Loom socks or something like that that you, you can wear in your sneakers and or whatever shoe it is you choose to wear. And it'll really help you get your sock on. And 
any of these pieces of equipment, you can look them up and there's oodles of YouTube videos on how to use this equipment. Uh, so next slide, please. So I like the Reacher because I have several of them at home and they help me get things, you know, that I can't reach, you know, under the bed or, or behind the fridge or wherever I can't reach. But that's also very helpful in dressing and it's, it's also helpful just to get everyday items off the floor so you don't have to bend over to pick up like your tissue box or your remote control. So a lot of times when we put ourselves in that posture where we're going down and picking something up, that's when we can fall. So if you're not strong as it is, that could be, a, you know, I, I, I've, I've gone into people's homes and there's all kinds of stuff on the floor. And I'm like, why don't you pick this up? And well, I can't because I'm too weak. I'm afraid I'm going to fall. Well, a reacher definitely could solve the problem because then they could just pick <laughs> it up with the reacher. So it's a handy piece of equipment. Next slide, please. So where do you get this stuff? So I always tell people you're gonna find the best price if you go online or you look other places other than your medical equipment stores. Your medical equipment stores are going to have these items for much more than what you can buy them online. My favorite place to go, which is probably a problem, is Amazon. So I buy a lot of stuff on Amazon and they have all of this equipment for purchase. And it's cheaper than if you were to go to performancehealth.com. It's even cheaper than if you were to go to your, your local durable medical equipment store. So you can purchase stuff from a medical equipment store. Like if you can think of in your, in your town where you're at, like where do they sell the wheelchairs or the, the braces or compression socks or oxygen tanks? Like that's where you're going to go to find this adaptive equipment because it's going to be there. So most insurance companies unfortunately don't cover uh, dressing equipment. It's going to be an out-of-pocket expense. So definitely try to look for the deals because that's, that's smarter to do that. So what do I tell my people when they come in here and they want to get stronger? What are the big things that I tell uh, my patients? I look at their posture. Posture is a killer. It can, it can cause all kinds of pain and all kinds of problems. And a lot of times people don't even realize that they have poor posture. Me sitting in this chair right now, my posture isn't that great. So bringing your shoulders back and sitting upright will help your back, will help your neck, will help your, your scapular muscles to contract so that they get stronger. So it's just sitting up straight every now and again and, and realizing that you are in that forward bent posture and, and tightening up those, those scapular muscles. An another thing is, is just stretching your neck from side to side, you know, because our, our, our neck muscles get really tight and, and the shoulder and the neck are so intimately related that if there's a problem in the shoulder, there's probably a problem in the neck. And then bringing your shoulders back and just rolling them back is really nice. Another thing I tell people is, is if you're not moving correctly, it's gonna be really hard to strengthen you. So we start off easy. We start with isometric exercises in which we are producing the muscle contraction, but we're not producing the movement, which will still give us increases in strength. So I, 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 tell, I wanna tell all of you to go see a therapist to be able to do these isometric exercises correctly because they can be tricky. Once you get the hang of them and you start getting stronger, that's when we can progress to other types of exercise with dumbbells or resistance bands, things like that. So the big, the big starting point is the isometric exercise. So I also see a lot of problems with wrist extension, people, people being able to raise their wrist up. And in order to have an adequate grasp, you need to be able to raise your wrist up and grab. A lot of times I see people with a lot of uh, weakness, they're, they're grabbing like this and, and their power of their grip is severely impaired because they can't go up. So I tell people, you know, definitely work on your extensors of your forearm because it's in this motion that we have the most power. So using a ball, you can, you can do some gripping exercises, but make sure your wrist is either in neutral or slightly up so that you can strengthen your extensors. 
So some coordination activities, because a lot of people, when they start experiencing some weakness in their arms and in their hands, their coordination is off. So they'll be dropping items or they won't be able to pick up those coins that fell on the table or they're going to have trouble uh, manipulating their buttons or zippers. And, and there's a lot of things that you can do, but you just have to do them. So you can pick any of these coordination activities you want and go, you know, do like three or four of them. And then when you get good at those, pick other, other exercises. But I, a big one is, you know, if you have a deck of cards, just shuffle them or, you know, any kind of craft activity, just get busy doing something like a paint by number or work with that modeling clay or, or any type of activity that you might want to, to work with. I always tell people stay away from sharp things, you know, don't, you know, think you can go back into the woodworking area and work with big saws or anything like that, because that would be very dangerous. But, you know, just find some stuff at home. Like if you're having trouble with writing and you're really frustrated with how your signature looks, start writing, start copying pages in a book. You know, you have to do whatever it is that you're having trouble with on a regular basis to be able to, you know, have the benefits of that uh, particular activity. You have to, if you're having trouble, do that activity. If you're having trouble getting coins off the table, get coins on the table and start picking them off the table. So go ahead and, and go to the next slide. So I guess this is Mary's way of saying you better keep <laughs> active. You, you either use it or you lose it. And these people are very active in this <laughs> slide. So if, if you guys have questions, we're, we're here, we're ready to answer them. That would be awesome. But thank you for your patience with us. And, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. I forgot I was muted. Um, we did. We do have some questions for you. So uh, first off, well, this person is curious. What do you think about acupuncture treatment for severe limb girdles? So acupuncture is is um, <clears throat> very a very ancient type of practice that was used in Asia. You know, many, 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 many many years ago centuries right yeah <laughs> so it's been it's been something that has slowly come into uh western culture. yeah western mm -hmm. culture so what what i think of it is anything that helps you feel better anything that helps you feel well do it mm -hmm. you know it's, acupuncture is not going to hurt you it's uh if you go to a person who really knows what they're doing it can help with pain I have yet to hear of anybody who says, yeah, the pain that I experience, you know, has gone away completely because I've never heard anybody <laughs> say that about acupuncture. I, I, they have to keep going back to see their therapist, but anything that helps you feel better and well, I say, do it. Yeah. It is okay. known to decrease toxins and, and have benefits to help you feel better mentally, emotionally, and those kinds of things too. So. Uh, the only drawback is I don't believe it's covered by insurance. So there's usually an out-of-pocket expense, um, you know, along those lines of massage therapy and things like that, even though it's a higher level skill. Um, but I think it's definitely, I agree, it, it's a benefit if it helps you. Give it a try. You know, it, it, it won't hurt you. And if you put forth the money and it doesn't have much benefit, then you're not that kind of person. And if it does, wonderful. Anything that helps, you know, any little thing. Okay, that's good advice. Um, we've had a couple people type in that um, stairs are difficult for them. Should they be practicing more stairs or should they be avoiding the stairs? There seems to be a little bit of confusion around what they should do. Well, with, with anything, as I was saying, moderation is really good for exercise in this population. So it depends on how intense the stairs are. If stairs are the most difficult thing and you're short of breath and super sore and can't do anything for the rest of the day because it causes so much effort, it may be more harmful than helpful. You know, you may be going into that realm where you need to start adapting. Um, if it's two stairs and that's okay versus a flight of stairs into a house or an apartment, you know, the two stairs might be fine. So you have to kind of think of yourself and how you're feeling with it. Um, on the other hand, if it's just a little bit difficult, 
I would keep doing it because you want to hold on to those skills as long as possible. You don't want to give something up too soon and then make yourself weaker. So it's a great exercise if it can stay within that moderate range. And okay. you know, also with type of stairs, you know, you have to consider that we have these perfectly measured stairs with handrails and everything in the therapy department. And people will say, well, I can do your stairs, but my stairs are like twice as high and we don't have handrails, you know, so there's so much to consider. I think um, you just have to kind of analyze how you're feeling about it and, and see how intense it is for you because you want to keep it if you can, but not to harm yourself. Okay. This mom has typed in she has a 13 year old um, with limb girdle 2i and neuromuscular scoliosis and she's scheduled for posterior spine surgery and her spine is at 61 percent would a brace or physical therapy be helpful at this point for her absolutely yeah we, we are actually encouraging it does she mean before the surgery happens or after? i believe so yes okay the before we actually are really encouraging what we're calling prehab <laughs> which is prior to surgeries because the stronger um, we can and better functional uh, a person is prior to surgery the better results we're seeing after the surgery so a consult okay, with therapist to see if bracing or exercises or anything like that would be helpful would be actually really good okay do vibration machines help? Um, this person has commented the ZAAZ machine. Are you familiar with that? I'm not sure exactly. Is that that, does it look like a gun? Kind of like, I think that's what they're talking about. I've seen ones you stand on. I've seen oh. one like ones that you, that, that I've seen a lot of different kinds yeah. of vibration okay. machines. Are they helpful at all? <laughs> uh, helpful as in relaxing you maybe anytime you put vibration on a muscle you're going to relax the muscle and um, a lot of times when you relax the muscle you can make yourself a little bit weaker for a little bit of time so I don't know I mean if it if it again it's a wellness type of, of approach like if you feel like it's making you better uh, a placebo effect is better than no effect. So if you like it and it's helping you, then do it. So okay. from my experience, some people have, like she said, some people have used that and they just believe in it so much that they believe it's making them stronger. I don't believe there's any research to support that it can like restore muscle activity or anything like that. It can provide relaxation so you can move a little bit easier, um, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't use it as like a strengthening type of intervention. Okay. Um, a couple questions surrounding physical therapy and how often you should do it. Um, some people are doing it a few times a year. Other people are doing it all the time. Do you have a recommendation for how often one should see physical therapy? And as a second point, you know, how does someone get that written towards insurance with that proper writing so they can get their physical therapy covered? A lot of times they have it for a few months and then their insurance doesn't cover it anymore. Well, insurance, physical therapy is very expensive. Um, you know, mm -hmm. insurance doesn't want to cover it full time. And, and I, I do what we call episodic care. So basically muscular dystrophy and these neurological diseases, whether it's MS, Parkinson's, anything like that, it's not going away. It's not like an ankle sprain that will heal in a couple weeks or you know, a total hip replacement that you recover from and then you're good to go, you know? So we do what's called episodic care where we see you for, you know, a plan of care. Usually the first one's longer. I usually write it for like eight weeks. And then we talk about your goals and we say, hey, you know, I want a little bit more. Okay. And usually insurance is okay with that. Um, the one thing that they don't want is to have you living in physical therapy full time because our objective is always to empower you to be able to function independently. We don't want you to live in physical therapy. We want you to be able to feel like you have this, I can manage this. Right. However, you know, in a few months, you know, sometimes there's new research or there's new ideas or you're having a new problem and it's nice to be able to come back to the therapy. And then insurance is usually perfectly fine with that. If, you know, as long as we take a little bit of time off and then, hey, come, you know, for a little episode of care three or four times a year. Some people do it seasonally, you know, Oh, I'm here for my winter session, you know, I'm here for my spring session. And then if the docs just write a script, you know, they put the diagnosis on there and usually it's just an evaluate and treat and you're good to go. 
Okay. Same, um, thing, right? same thing. Same thing. <laughs> Do you happen to have any resources to where a person, I mean, particularly with limb girdle, but um, people are seem to be typing in that they've been having difficulties finding physical therapists who are unfamiliar with neuro. Um, do you have any recommendations for people to find a therapist that is um, focused on neuromuscular? There is a list on the American Physical Therapy Association webpage. Okay. Where there's like a find, your, find a therapist and it okay. will list all of, you know, like it has me on there as an Erie PA, you know, and it'll, it'll, it'll give contact information. So no matter okay. where you are in the United States for the American Physical Therapy Association, I know, I know we, we might have a few people calling in from other countries. Sure. Um, I'm sure you have a similar association where they, they purposely do this because it is difficult to find. And, mm -hmm. um, and even if you don't find one close by, I mean, I have people coming from hours away just to get the consult from a neurological clinical specialist. But even if you don't have an NCS type of person in your area, you may have somebody who's like working towards it or has a special interest or may have seen some cases. And that's when I, you know, I suggest you give these clinics a call and say, hey, do you have someone with a special interest in neurological, particularly limb girdle muscle muscular dystrophy? Because they might. And maybe they just haven't sat for the exam yet or didn't want to spend the money, but they have the knowledge. You know, just because somebody doesn't have the NCS doesn't mean they don't know about it. So it's a good question to ask the clinics. Locally. And Mary, what, what was that website again? Um, it's the American Physical Therapy Association, the APTA. Okay, great. Thank you. For America. <laughs> sure. sure. Um, all right. Just a couple more questions uh, around water aerobics. A few, a few people have chatted in around water aerobics. <laughs> Not speak water aerobics. Mm -hmm. And um, their breathing has gotten so worse. So is there a recommendation around water therapy that you could you could talk about? Oh, so anytime you're in a pool type environment, it's going to be hard to breathe in there because it's very humid. So people uh, who have trouble breathing are going to have trouble in like a closed building with a pool. Uh, you know, pool therapy is really good if you have really sore joints, you need to alleviate pressure off your joints. But I think where your money is better spent is in land therapy. Okay. Get yourself weight bearing, get yourself with a therapist, physical therapist or occupational therapist where you're actually working against gravity in a meaningful way. Uh, pool therapy, you know, is, is awesome, but we try to transition people away from the pool and onto land because that's where you live your life. Okay. Do you have any comments about the um, Peloton cycling? Do you recommend that, not recommend that? Well, that's a pretty intense mm -hmm. cycling system. You know, I, I think that if you can find a bike that a recumbent bike might be easier on your back, okay. it's probably better spent money than on a cycle that has you upright. I don't know if Mary has anything to say about that, but yeah, rec recumbent bike is really great for the neurological population because it's, especially if it's recumbent, it's, it's a comfortable position, it's easy on the joints and it really encourages blood flow because blood flow to the brain and the body is super important for muscle recovery, for cognition and all of those things. So you can accomplish something that may be a little bit more intense with blood flow without being really hard on your muscles and joints. Um, kind of along the lines of the pool therapy thought process, but mm -hmm. with the pool therapy, again, you have that water against your chest. Sometimes the, the therapy pools are a little too warm for people. You know, so you really have to find um, an alternative sometimes if you're not tolerating that. And the recumbent bike is a good one. Do you have any recommendations for people in power wheelchairs for exercise? And I know that's really a broad question. Um, <laughs> up, you know, are there anything with the upper torso they could do? Absolutely. Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah. I, I think even if you're in a wheelchair, you know, you, you can still seek out a therapist and, and get those isometric exercises happening where you're actually producing the muscle contraction, but not the movement. You know, you, you, you need to uh, ask your doctor for a therapy order for <laughs> PT or OT and, you know, get there and help, 
help is there. You just have to seek it out. And a lot of times people think, well, you know, why, you know, why bother? Mm -hmm. Well, you bother because it'll help you get stronger and it'll slow down the disease process. And then from a PT perspective, a lot of times we will work on getting people standing frames. If you're wheelchair bound and you have nothing activating in your lower extremities, but you, it's really, really healthy still to get the weight bearing. Okay. Uh, so there are standing frames that can stand you up, um, allow you for that weight bearing, but you're completely supported. We use this with spinal cord injuries too. Um, another benefit is breathing. You know, you can get in that standing position to open up your chest and breathe better. You can work on tabletop activities, like with OT, if you're in a standing position, you get that okay. weight bearing through the joints. It's good for digestion. We're just not meant to be sitting. You know, we're not designed to sit all the time. So being able to have some equipment to stand you up daily is actually really, really good for the rest of your body as, as this um, progresses. Okay. Lots of stuff we can do with power wheelchair people still. <laughs> Don't worry. They just need, they, okay, you need to ask, ask their therapist. Um, this person says that they tend to lock their knee while walking. Are they doing damage to their knee? Yes. Okay. Over time. Not, not immediately. I mean, it takes a lot of repetition. Uh, that's when we start to, we go into knee strengthening exercises if possible. Um, sometimes that muscle loss is lost. There's nothing we can do about it. It's the disease. So we go into bracing. Um, so that's another service that we can provide is hooking you up with a good orthotist. Um, we work very closely. We have one who comes right to the clinic and visits us all the time and sees patients with us uh, because um, uh, AFOs, um, ankle foot orthoses, knee ankle foot orthoses, those kinds of things are just general knee bracings. Um, okay. can really, really help to save the joints because you don't want to wear out your joints just because your muscles are getting weak. Okay. That's very important. Um, and I believe we have time for one more question. This person is experiencing atrophy where they cannot straighten their right hand, um, the fingers on their right hand. Is this possibly due to overuse or just a side effect of the dystrophy? Uh, it's probably, uh, well, since you have the muscle weakness, uh, you're not going to be able to use your hand as much. So it's a combination of the two. But whenever I start seeing that atrophy in the hand, I always try to get people in the appropriate brace so that we can avoid flexion contractures. We can avoid the hand looking like this, which can be very painful. Mm -hmm. We would rather have the hand postured like this. <laughs> so we, we, want, we want that hand in a, in a neutral position so that we don't get those contractures. But uh, bracing is definitely something that can be done. And again, I can't stress this enough get your doctor to write you a therapy order because we can help. And these braces are often covered by insurance, mm -hmm. whether it's for the mm -hmm. hand, for the foot, for the knee. So it's something that you wouldn't even need an out-of-pocket expense. Mm -hmm. And another argument to, hey, let's do this episodic therapy because in the summer, hey, I, my knee wasn't buckling. Well, now it is a year later, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's new issues that pop up and we need to follow you almost like a family doctor would. You, know, you get a PT in your life and an OT in your life to help you through the process. That's okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, this was a lot of information and I know you definitely spurred a lot of comments and questions. So thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank Have you a great so much rest for of having us. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye. And up next, we will be having um, Dr. Johnson talk about research and limb girdle. So stay tuned, we will begin at the top of the hour.